Turntable Topics brings you compelling interviews with amazing people from around the world, highlighting the creative excellence of musicians, artists, singers, authors, and entrepreneurs. Hello, viewers. This is your host, Taurus Rags, and this is Turntable Topics. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Whitney Parnell. Whitney is the CEO and co-founder of Service Never Sleeps. She also has an album that's coming out this summer entitled, What Will You Do? The debut single that we'll be discussing today is entitled, The Talk. Alongside Whitney today, I will be speaking with Joshua Davies. Joshua, in addition to being a music producer, music director in the DMV area at the Zion Church, he is also the producer on Whitney's album and single, The Talk. So let's dive into it and get to know Whitney and Josh a little bit more. As promised, I have here with me tonight Whitney Parnell and Joshua Davis. And what better way than to expose you guys to who these two amazing people are other than to let them each individually give you a little bit about their background before we dive into um, all of the great things that we're going to bring to you tonight to highlight these two amazing individuals. As I said in the opening, Whitney is the CEO and co-founder of Service Never Sleeps. She also has an amazing album that will be coming out this summer. We'll be discussing the single that's being released, The Talk, and sitting next to her with that beautiful smile is Joshua Davis. Um, he's actually the music producer on the collaboration. So Whitney, if you want to start out and let people know a little bit about your background. So thank you so much for having us today, Tora. We're so excited for this opportunity. Uh, as you mentioned, I am the CEO and co-founder of Service Never Sleeps. We founded in 2015, the idea being that just as social injustice never sleeps, service combating it should never sleep either. So our whole focus is on promoting allyship an active way of life that works to ensure equality, opportunity, and inclusion for everyone. We do that through several programs. But a little bit of background about myself is that I am a foreign service brat. In other words, meaning I don't know where I'm from at all. Mm -hmm. uh, moved all around the world uh, and was a wonderful lifestyle that at most really emphasized for me the sense of shared humanity and that we should care about our fellow world citizens, which maybe become a professional humanitarian by term and then had me start this nonprofit, uh, but also played a big role in a lot of the music that I write, which is social justice focused. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just trying to make this world a better place through promoting social justice and getting everyone else to be involved in that. And I love that. And that was one of the reasons, you know, we've connected a few times on the phone and we've had some, you know, very detailed conversations. And by the end of this interview, the viewers will get to know why I always say you're such an astounding person. Josh, you want to give us a little bit about your background? Absolutely. First of all, like Whitney said, I'm so happy to be here. This is going to be fun. This is uh, exciting. Um, so this is, this is great. Um, so I'm Josh Davies. Very simple. I'm a you know started out I'm a musician. Um, started out uh, young playing music. I'm getting started and now. I produce. Um, I uh, am a music director for different groups, different artists, and um, I just have the privilege of working with Whitney on this on this project. Uh, she came to me a while ago and, and told me that she wanted to about the project and what she was doing the project for. And um, I'm just excited to be to be a part, I get the, the opportunity to use my gifts um, for, for this cause. I also own a company called Metro Entertainment. And uh, we pretty much have a few different entities, but one of the things that we really focus on is we offer music lessons, music classes to different private schools and just people in general. So we offer classes, I have a team of amazing um, musicians that work with me on, on this, in this company, so yeah. This will not be the last time you will see these two wonderful people on um, Turntable Topics. We will be doing another separate interview with Josh, and we'll also be doing a special highlight just on Whitney's organization, Service Never Sleeps, because that in itself is its a whole different entity, but it's something that needs to be brought to the forefront and that you need to be aware of. It's an amazing organization. So after these, don't feel like this will be the end of it because we will be bringing more from each of these wonderful people. So Whitney, um, when we, you know, we first spoke and I was first introduced to you, you were described to me as a millennial artist slash social injustice activist. Break down what is a millennial artist? 
Yeah. Uh, so millennials get a bad rap sometimes, but also a really great one. But I, I think it's a really important thing to mention because when you look at social change and social movements that have taken place throughout history, it's always young people who really start that off. And I think that there's something to be said about that. And you've got the millennial generation, which has is so socially aware and so passionate about issues that I think it's really special to our generation. And I really want to pay homage to that and really identifying myself as part of this new movement that's really trying to make a difference. So that's why it's so important to really um, touch on that millennial piece. Uh, in terms of the activism piece, it's so interesting because I think some people are turned off by the term activism and I just, I don't know how to respond to that. But um, I do want to pave a whole new lane for what activism looks like in this sort of millennial black woman identity in the sense that I'm always of the belief that the way that I move forward is really breaking down what piece of me represents marginalization and my blackness, my womanhood, through which I should feel empowered to fight for my people, but also the right to just thrive and survive. But what pieces of me represent privilege, my my religion, my being educated, my being housed, my, my sexual orientation, through which I need to be an ally for that corresponding marginalization. So in my activism, I want to pave a whole lane that really takes but that whole both of those sides and is passionate about fighting for my people but also equally as passionate about fighting where i should be executing allyship and so this lane of activism for me is supposed to be a very unique one that i hope that everybody can take on the charge of doing so activists may not look exactly like what people see it to have been in the past but right. hey I'm here to try to make a whole new type. <laughs> but, I mean, you're right, because a lot of the times when somebody says, oh, I'm an activist, people tend to talk and run. They're like, oh, it's a, it's a stigma that goes with it. And I really like that you're trying to pave the way for a different outlook when it comes to activism, because it's something that can be very rewarding. Before I dive into the single um, and discussing the talk, um, I want to ask Josh, when Whitney first came to you and said, I have this album idea. And the wow. album is titled, What Will You Do? And when she came to you and broke down what the album was about, what was your response, your initial thought on taking on this project? Well, <laughs> it's funny you brought that up. <laughs> okay, I want to hear this first. Well, so the, I think we need to go to the, the way that she was bringing up the project to really understand my thought process. So. Whitney is very, very passionate about this, which is, I think, the viewers would appreciate. Like when she's, you know, in creating a song in this album, she's like, she's really, she's in it. She believes that um, we were actually just talking about um, just the, the, the impact that you know this album is going to have, and Whitney, that Whitney's going to have, just by her, her belief and just the, the, the thought that um, she wants people to have. Um, a chance to have an equal equal rights, uh, justice to be for everybody. I mean, she's really just passionate about that. So she was very passionate when she brought the album up to me and saying that, you know, I really want to bring out these topics and I want to talk about this this thing on this song and this thing on this song. And I'm, you know, she's telling me all this and I'm like, um, <laughs> this is this is a little this is a little deep. <laughs> you gonna be going in deep on the on the, on the album, aren't we? But um, I think that uh, yeah, my initial thought was. There's two folks. I, I thought that um, it was very serious topics, and I thought it was going to be a little tough because people don't normally, you know, they, this is not a normal type of subject matter for an album. Right. I think that um, I knew it was going to be a challenge, but I was also very excited about the challenge that we would give people, also the opportunity to really put this out um, in a way that is um, challenging to people so that they can change, so that they can be provoked to thought. Can I can I just throw something else in there, Tora? Oh, so I don't know if this was mentioned, but Josh and I know each other because we go to the same church. Yes. I sing on the praise and worship Zion team. Church. Yeah, Zion Church. Um and Josh is the music director of the entire department. Right, right. Yeah. So I'm I'm on the praise and worship team and and I had gotten the idea to start Service Never Sleeps and I'm sure we'll get into how I wrote all these songs. But anyways, I realized that I wanted to do this album in alignment with Service Never Sleeps for this whole brand of empathy calling to action and had just gotten on the team maybe like six months prior. So we hadn't known each other that well. And I just went to Josh and first was like, 
hey, so if I want to record some music, like, who do I go to? How do I go to? And he said something like, you know, I, I know people, I'll send you to people, da, 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 da. And then, like, I prayed about it, and I just felt like I was being told to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so this wasn't, like, one of those 3 a.m. calls where he answers the phone, and you're all excited, like, Josh, I have a great idea. You did approach him during the daylight waking hours on this. <laughs> I cornered him after <laughs> after rehearsal. I was just like, Josh, I want to take you to dinner and talk to you about a project for a social justice album that I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and so all that to say, though, that the fact that he was willing to take this on as a pro bono opportunity to really get this message across, in addition to all the other stuff that he has going on, I think is super telling to his character. And and I'm just so grateful right. that you were willing to do that. You know, two years later now, we're really good friends. But yeah, right, right, right. Uh, when I first I, approached him. I first you almost ended after that conversation. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> but, I mean, because Josh is, Josh is very true when he said it's a deep album. All of the, uh, when you sent me the list of titles, I mean, I've read through it several times since sending me the list of each of the titles on the album. And we're going to keep everybody in suspense and we'll go through, you know, the different titles more towards the end of the interview. Because like I said, it's, they're heart wrenching subjects they're deep things that a lot of people don't want to talk about things that should be talked about in order to progress towards healing so i think this album and this idea this creative is a beautiful idea and i'm honored to be able to sit and you know speak with both of you tonight on this project so i want to extend my thank you for both of you giving me your time tonight thank you thank you, so thank you. Thank you. we're so grateful and then Josh, real quick, what was, okay, so once she came to you with the project, now as a music producer, now I like to say a lot of the music now is like the push button, push button productions. With this type of content that Whitney put together, it's really hard to just sit down and say, okay, let's just put something together, let's just do it. What was your creative processes behind these strong topics that she's discussing on the album? Well, that's a great question. So my process was, first of all, I wanted to really understand where she was coming from. So she sent, she had uh, the songs, the, the lyrics already sketched out, and she sent me drafts of all the songs. So what I did was, I just took, um, I had to be at least, I mean, a week. Um, I can't remember when we first started, how long, what that time frame was, but I know I sat with the music and just listened over and over and over again of just what she was trying to get out, the message that she wanted to um, really get out to the listener. So I wanted to understand where she was coming from, first of all, and then the process practically was, um, I wanted to make sure that the music embodied that message. So. It's obviously uh, tough subjects. So I wanted to, the music can almost be a, um, the drawing factor to people listening to it. Right. And once you, hear, once you get them listening to it, then the message would just be the, the punch. You know what I mean? So I wanted to just really be strategic about how, you know, with the, you know what, what can couple that message in a way where um, people, people will be provoked to thought, but also be, um, grooving too, like oh, okay, this is good, and they don't even know that they're like really they're they're digesting something that um, we really want them to to uh, to be changed by. So, well, and I read the intro on the talk; it still gets me every time because it's it's kind of haunting and it kind of draws you in, and you're like, okay. Well, where are they going with this? You're waiting on Whitney to start singing, you know, and hear the rest of the melodies and everything combined in it. So now as far as the um, the the debut single, The Talk, what drove you, what inspired you, Whitney, to release that as the first song debut on the album? Well, that was actually the last song that I wrote. Uh, the rest of my music I'd written over the past 10 years. And uh, when I had first sent Josh the 10 songs that were going to be on the album, that wasn't on it. And then last summer, Alton Sterling was killed. The next day, Philando Castile was killed. And um, that was just an incredibly difficult and heart-wrenching week, just to think about all the implications about the fact that this talk, which has been passed down across black households for generations, still just feels so necessary and urgent today. And I had written that 
towards the end of the week, with, with, with all these songs, it was just sort of the case that I was just sort of hit with with the melody and hit with particular words. And then it would just all sort of fall out within hours. And that was something that it was like maybe four o'clock in the morning towards the latter part of the week where I was just so anxious and filled with anxiety over what was going on, but also really angry because it had been this week where on the one hand, I was trying to process what this meant for me, what this meant for my sisters, future loved ones, and just the implications of our own people's history. But also, you know, I run an organization that's about social justice and about allyship and talking to a lot of stakeholders that weren't able to understand just why I was just so upset about this, who were out of different communities that were very well intentioned, but it was almost more offensive to feel like I was having to prove why I had the right to be upset and what the implications were. So it just seemed like I needed to write this as a way not only to have my own catharsis and to provide validation to a community that was collectively mourning, but also I was going just blue in the face trying to get a point across that I thought I was making so clear to, to, to other communities. And it just seemed that, you know what, let me just, how about you just hear the typical talk that black parents give their kids across the country that's been happening for decades and let you pull from that what the implications are about the fact that this is a collective talk and what the like what are, what would you say are the implications of that and it just sort of hit me you know to a certain extent you can have as much evidence as possible but nothing's going to touch people more than empathy in their heart and and so that that is that was a very difficult week that continues to be difficult, but hey, um, that that's what inspired that song that week. Well, and you know, for the viewers, if they haven't gathered, the talk is based, a song that's based around racism and police brutality. And net with more than ever now, you know, Whitney and I were having a discussion um, last week about, you know, in the in this day and age, I still find it perplexing and hard to believe that we're having these discussions and still having to go over this same topic. But now more than ever, it seems almost rampant. And there has to be something, um, some sort of way to frame this so people understand that it's not just a community or a culture of people saying, we want justice. A lot of people relate it to when they say, hands up, you know, don't shoot. And that's one of the main lines all the way throughout that song, hands up, hands up. So if you can talk a little bit on why you felt it was so important for people from other cultures to understand the framing behind this album as a whole and the framing and discussion around the talk. Lots to unpack there. Uh, <laughs> work backwards. It's really interesting because it, it's, it's so interesting because it feels like this talk is still necessary today. But one of my closest friends, who is also very much in the movement, I, he was the first person that I sent it to after I wrote it. No offense, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I called Josh the next day and was like, we got to take out a song and put this one in. Right, right, right. So I, I promise right, you were right. in the top right. 10. <laughs> um, but my friend, he was like, Whitney, I understand what you're trying to do here, but I'm frustrated that I'm frustrated that we have to give this and not just like historically the, the implications behind that, but almost he was like, I don't want people to co get confused with the messaging that the responsibility is on us to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And so that's why this is such an, a complex thing to unpack. It's like we shouldn't have to give this talk. But the fact of the matter is, that is very much the life or death situation that we have. Even the day before I released this, my baby sister called me to tell me of a terrifying profiling event where she said she literally followed those lyrics to stay alive. Otherwise, it could have been a really bad situation. Wow. So it's a perfect demonstration of she should not have had to do that. This is the most innocent person that I will and sweetest person I'll ever know. Uh, but she did it because she knew that she had a better chance of getting out alive. And so um, it... I think there are so many implications behind the fact that this this has historically been something that we've been taught. It's just part of culture here that has to demonstrate to you larger systemic oppression at hand in terms of being black in America. And so that whole hands up 
notion is just so complex and that there's just a deep history there in terms of oppression of black people that has just, even as we've gotten more equal rights, right? Systemic oppression is the, is the case that it's not just about equality in terms of rights, it's about equality in terms of experience, it's about opportunity, it's about inclusion. And I would say that you could see the evolution, you can almost see with the evolution of times that this is demonstrating in, in this ways in regards to law enforcement that really has its implications around being black in America. So that's, it just makes me so frustrated because uh, there are so many implications there. But I will say, and just like with the entire album, <laughs> I need to learn from this in terms of um, what my friend can attest to, my constant ranting. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most effective way that you can get through to people is empathy. What I always say about social justice is three things. That social justice is right, that nobody loses with social justice, and that empathy is the key to unpacking everything, right? There's something about saying, man, if I were in this situation, what would I want people to do for me and how would I feel? And so that is why all of the songs on this album are written from firsthand perspective as a way to say, take out your judgment about the situation and just imagine if you were listening to this from your daughter or your son, or if actually you were the one singing these words, how would you want people to react from this and to this? And how, what would you want people to do from there? So empathy really is the call to action that is, uh, is sort of rooted in, in this entire album and it, particularly in this song. Wow. Now, Josh, since you've been working on this song, when you're out and about, have you had that knee jerk reaction to kind of look over your shoulder? You know, if a blue and white rolls by, has it made you think or move throughout your day in a different from before you started working with Whitney on this album? Um, uh, so I wouldn't say different. I don't think I'm moving any differently. I think the reality is I'm a black man in America. <laughs> and, you know, that's the reality is, I, you know, I've, I've been pulled over and treated unfairly before. Um, but the song was just a reminder um, of the reality that we live in, but also um, really just that, you know, it was just a reminder to keep certain things in mind you know, I obviously as we're going through this process and, you know, I, I enjoyed working on the song for a few different reasons, because obviously I've been through situations where I've been treated unfairly, um, but also too, but to give people hope too. Um, I think that this is, this is not the, um, a song where we're bashing or we're just trying to say it just to say it, but we want to, you know, just give people hope that, um, we're, you know, people are seeing, we're recognizing that there is an issue. Um, and sometimes, you know, that reminder is enough in itself to say, okay, there are ways to get out of this. It's not just like a hopeless situation where, you know, you know, this is going to be, a, you know, it's, it's bad, but it's not going to just end bad. There are ways to, to get out of certain situations if you are able to obviously be calm, collected, keep your cool and fight the right way. And that there's hope in the sense that we don't just want black people listening to this, right? Right. Most of you I've said this to are not black people, right? Because there's something to be said. We were just talking to someone this weekend who is white, who was saying that, you know, she's always having to have these conversations with her own to demonstrate, look, th there's an issue here that you're not understanding. So the more people that we can touch yeah. outside of this community Absolutely. that can, can have that perspective can, that can be touched yeah. or even have a way to articulate an empathy that they already have, mm -hmm. that's empowering them to be the allies, to go and influencing their own at that dinner table so that their own could mm -hmm. pre be preventative in itself. So mm -hmm. that that's the hope in, in both Bringing awareness as well. Awareness does make a yeah. difference, yeah. And equips well, people to be able to make a difference. So it has to feel amazing from a producer standpoint, because a lot of producers, they're looking for the next big club hit, the next big, you know, right. thing that's going to land them on the Grammys. So knowing that you're an integral part of yeah. this movement, how does that feel from a producer standpoint? Amazing. It's it's like, it's just as big as having a, a club banger or whatever. Like, I, I love it because the thing about music is that music lives on forever. You know what I mean? So even in 60 years, 70 years, this song is going to be living on way past myself. Um, so I, I'm excited about the opportunity for not just what um, it's going to bring now, but just for forever. Like this is a, a staple and a, a, a testament to um, 
and it's gonna be—I think it's gonna be a blessing for people's lives and a reminder, bringing bringing awareness to to everybody. So I love it. I love it. Feels I good. agree, and I cannot wait to hear all of the other songs and listen to the album as a whole. Because right now, you know, I've just been listening to the talk, but some of these, you know, and just to go through real quick, um, my life. That is one of, I'm going through the titles of the album. So my life touches on general loneliness and it's written from the perspective of a homeless individual. Closeted touches on LGBTQ bullying and hate crimes. Hold on focuses on mental health and suicide issues. So when we say that this is a strong, deep album, we are not kidding you. And it's, a, you know, it, the way that Whitney has this structured also is all of the proceeds are being allocated in a special way. Can you tell a little bit about what you're doing with the proceeds from the album? Yeah, so we're very blessed that Opus One Studios, which is a charity label, is uh, the label through which this album is uh, being released. And every cent of the proceeds are going to my organization, Service Never Sleep. So, but the whole idea being that while this is an independent effort, there is so much alignment between this whole idea of really the best way to in fact, social change is by a call to action from people. And you can get a call to action from people through empathy. And so um, the album is, is very much aligned with Service Never Sleeps goals, which is why every single cent uh, of the proceeds will go to that organization's efforts. Well, I love that. And I'm definitely going to be supporting the full album once it's ready to go and purchasing each of the singles or the album as a whole. And I really hope that you viewers will do the same because like I said, this is, to me, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. So I hope that you support this and do, you know, do a little bit of research to find out a little bit more about each of these amazing individuals in between time until I can get them each back here separately. And so now I kind of want to delve into, like we said, the talk exposes an all too real dialogue that families are having to have. Can you kind of give a little framework around that talk? Exactly what are parents having to say to their kids and family members before they leave? Um, yeah, well, Obviously, it looks a little different uh, based on each individual, but we tried to break it down pretty simply to three main points. If, if you're starting, if, if you're starting to get approached, stop is point number one. Point number two is in that engagement, just nod and smile, just to get through it, being as mild as you can. And number three, stay alive. And that that's ultimately what it comes down to is those three points. You know, stop. Be mild, yes, okay, and please just get home alive, which uh, seems pretty simple, but is heart-wrenching in itself. And I'd say that you see, there, there's, I mean, I think we, both of us can give examples of when we first heard the talk or gave the talk or most recently heard the talk. Uh, I've definitely heard and given it a lot in my life at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they all look a little different, but I think those are the biggest takeaways. And there's just implications in the fact that that this is just a, all you got to do is say it's the talk to another black person and they know what you're talking about and implications around the fact that all this is around how do you make sure that you get out of this alive and i was talking to another friend of mine who was white who was saying how you know when i get stopped i'm thinking man this is ruining my day mm -hmm. and, and that is not what i'm thinking when yeah. something's behind me. i'm thinking oh my gosh heart rate is multiplying and okay i just i just want to get stay alive and the yeah. implications behind someone's reaction to to the possibility of getting stopped i think has is quite telling yeah i think whitney hit on the main points but that talk for me so i'm putting myself in a moment uh it's definitely um <clears throat> a situation where you know i want to explain that being right in the moment doesn't matter <laughs> and like i think it's more important to get out of that situation and fight you know, other, you know, in another way, you can't be mad in the moment and then trying to like, you gotta, you gotta be in control. Um, even if you don't get a say, if, if you don't get, you know, even if you don't prove your point in the moment, I think that for me, that's the point that in talking to different people, I, I try to like relay and I keep that in mind myself that in the moment doesn't matter because you don't want to be put in a situation where, you know, you're aggravating the situation. Um, you just want to fight in a different way. And it's, it's, you're not, you're, you're most likely not going to win if you're trying to fight in the moment. I and mean, that's just the reality of of where we are. And we got to fight a different way. So you got to got to 
keep your composure. It's not it's not easy. It's not you know um, comfortable, but I think it's definitely more important to um, keep your composure. Mm-hmm. And so I think what's frustrating though, and one thing that we want to make sure is clear in in this song being from the perspective of the talk is that this. Uh, this tension between sort of like what Josh was saying about how, look, a lot of times you're pulled over and they're wrong for it. You haven't done anything wrong, but get out alive versus so many, so much evidence showing us that there wasn't any altercation, right? And that regardless of what your reaction looked like, even if you were as mild as possible, still a lot of times people are getting hurt and killed. That's exactly what we saw last year that were that, um, um, that inspired this song. So it's, <laughs> I have interesting reactions when people don't quite pull away what I'm hoping from this, when they're like, oh my gosh, this is so moving because now it's just given all this, it's really told, told people about how to just respect <laughs> and stay mild when this happens. Now you've saved so many lives. And I'm like, no, actually, you know, there, there's supposed to be some irony in this, in the fact that when you look at a lot of these cases, people did just that and were still killed, right? And so right. There, there's something said about the fact that it's, <laughs> I can't get into one more argument with somebody about, well, don't you think that it can be on Black people's end too to make sure that they're acting mild and stuff? Well, when, when my response is, evidence is showing that even when they do that, like, the, it's it's not on our behavior a lot of the times, you know. That's that's part of it, but like that that's not the bigger problem that we have going on here. And so I think that's my only my only concern sometimes is that I don't want people to take this and and then take it to a direction that I wasn't hoping that they'd get. But hey, if it's starting some conversation to where someone can then provide some new perspective, great. For that naysayer that's you know sitting back and they're watching, they're like, I've tried that. I've done all of that. You know, I've watched other people um, go through step one, two, three, and four and follow all of the rules. You know, they've subdued themselves. They've remained calm. And what do you say to that person? So that person that's watching and they're like, none of this will ever work. Just that 100% naysayer. What do you say to that person? Well, okay. I'll... I'll be honest here about the intentions of this song. Uh, to a certain extent, sure, maybe this is like a rule book for people, but I did not write this song as a rule book. I wrote this as a way to validate a community that was mourning the fact that we have to give this talk and to provide perspective for, uh, for communities understanding the fact that this talk still had to happen because we were still getting killed. So I can't say that I would be talking to someone who's saying, I've tried all of that and none of it works. I don't know that I can speak to the hope that I'm giving saying, but if you do this, then you'll stay alive. Right. I think the hope more speak towards is, look, I feel you and this is not okay at all. And I know that a lot of this this stuff happening is not our fault, but the hope is that in a message being out like this, more people are gonna hear this and maybe be influenced by it so that it can stop. And so I I just do wanna make it clear that my intentions with this song are not to tell black people what to do to stay alive. It's to validate the fact that we mourn over the fact that we have to do this. It's really to provide perspective about the fact that we have to do this in the first place and what that means. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. And I really like that you put it out there like that. Um, I mean, because that pretty much squashes any naysaying, I guess, in it, because it's just the fact that when you're forced to have to do something, as a human, you know, as a human being that makes you feel lesser than, that other people don't have to deal with. So we as a community just want to feel like everybody else does. Exactly. And that's simply, a- I mean, that I love the way that you put that. Some people like to jump right into things. Um, we like to call them the, uh, the, we have a keyboard activists that will get on and they will type all day long and put in their two cents. Then you have the people that they will get out there, you know, they attend the marches, they do things within the community. Then you have that other person that's sitting at home and they don't know what direction to take. Do you have any ideas that people can just within their own community? Because to me, that's where it starts at, working within your community. This is this is everything that I'm about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh, get ready, get ready. Um, 
it's interesting because we're in a time where so many people are like, I need to do something, which is awesome. I'm a believer that so many people want to do stuff and that uh, I always say, like, when you look at the spectrum of people on this end, you've got people, not you, Josh, but you've got people causing the problem on this end. You've got what I call pitchfork people. So the ones who are like, give me the pitchforks and give me the signs. I'm ready to go. And then all throughout here, you've got the influenceables, people who'd be willing if they were just ever so moved. And so... I think that we can really coordinate a lot of that energy. And I think that where a lot of anxiety comes is people will say, I need to get involved, but I don't know how. I can't be calling my senator every day and I'm not going to like shut down the streets every day. And so what really you need to break down is that you've got the direct action skill, which goes all the way from like service to self-help to education, to advocacy, to direct action, all stuff that you can do that's sort of within the, like maintaining the systems versus trying to just break the whole system. And then you've got like allyship. And for me, allyship is just a way of life. It's how you work on yourself to just constantly educate yourself to become as conscious and respectful towards marginalized communities, uh, but then figure out where you fit in that direct action scale. So I always say that people can already just make a difference in just constantly committing to working on themselves and being bridge builders with their own to understand these issues. We're moving the needle just as much by going and doing service as we are by when somebody says something, really taking the time to engage with them and bring them over. You still move the needle of social justice that way. So I really would just want to empower people that in being bold and being uh, deliberate about constant self-education and others' education, that makes a difference. But then separately, I'll say that what excites me about service is that it's twofold. The most effective service is one that's mutually beneficial, right? We've right. got to take a patriarchal idea of like, I'm coming down into this community to help you poor soul. No, no, no. The best service is when you are in the community and really working together and understanding what needs look like and really supporting that, not trying to sort of impose. And in that you're growing and you are getting a lot out of that as well so that it's mutual. But then I'll also say what's beautiful about service is that we can all do service appropriate to our own interests our own talents and our own skills. So even with Service Never Sleeps, like our main programming is facilitating matching young professionals to do skills-based service with local nonprofits to help those nonprofits grow in capacity. So like literally a way of saying, use the skills that you have from your job to actually help make a difference. But then you've also got other people who like use their talents to make a difference. Josh being a perfect example with this album. But then you even got people like, even though my organization is about skills-based service, I'm always gonna personally um, feel most impactful by doing outreach to our chronically homeless neighbor or answering a rape hotline and, and meeting the survivor at the hospital. That For me, it's always gonna be about that intimate thing. So all that to say is that there's an avenue of service and impact for everyone that's really relative to their interests, talents, and skills. But if you gotta root yourself in that why, in that allyship, in that social justice, in that equality, opportunity, and inclusion, and then figure out what your fit is on that direct action action skill and how your impact looks like in a way that's meeting and supporting, not imposing. Well, I have to ask Josh, does she bring this type of fire in the entire album? Yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. And the studio sessions too. <laughs> wow. So, and I, yeah. you touched on, um, I want to put down a quick question here. When you spoke about the allies, you your organization, do you, do you sit down with an individual, go through the different things that they have and help them to just, you know, determine what skills they have to be able to go out into the community and share? Yeah, well, for Service Never Sleep, it is primarily skills-based service. So our main program is a year-long fellowship of part-time service for working young professionals. So people from your Deloitte's and your Accenture's and your EY's uh, who are still working full-time, but through this fellowship, they're matched with a local nonprofit to do skills-based service to help these nonprofits grow in the capacity to execute the solutions that they already have. And so it, it's a pretty intensive process where we really identify nonprofits that are at the ground level, know what the issues are in the communities and have solutions to be able to execute that, just lack the capacity to execute as fully as they could. So we work with the nonprofits to really identify what are they trying to do, what skills-based need do they have, ranging from operational to strategic to uh, marketing to programmatic, and really develop full-year position descriptions that take at least 10 hours of service a month to really 
focus on marketing, as you know, that skills-based stuff. And then separately, we select our fellows and we really evaluate what is their passion, what are their interests in terms of issue areas, how are they hoping to use their skills, are they hoping to use skills that they use at their job, are they hoping to use skills that they're not able to use at their job, are they hoping to gain new skills, and like how do we find the best match between your interests, your skill desire, and then the nonprofit's needs, and then match them all together. So it's pretty intensive, but that's like service should be intense. Service should be something where you're going to make a commitment to making a difference, which takes time and it takes deliberation. You should be deliberate about thinking about what the impact is that you're going to have. So yeah, it takes work, but change of the world takes work. So uh, that's why we have a pretty deliberate process there. So it's about moving with a purpose. Like a lot of people that know me quite well, I say do everything with a purpose. Spending this time with you guys tonight, there's a purpose for it to bring that awareness. So the same thing with, you know, the skills and the allyship, you're doing it and you're, you know, you're doing your community service and your activism with a strong purpose. It's not, you know, just a walk on the beat, oh, I'll do it for a little while and then, you know, move on to the next thing. It's something that really takes dedication. <laughs> and we can see that you're very passionate about it, And I wow. love that. You can just see her just get fired up every time, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I know um, we're coming down. We have about 13 minutes or so left. And at the end, so you guys, you know, stick around because they are going to give us a preview and close out the show with giving you a preview of the song, the talk. And I guarantee you're going to love it because I do. And so now I'm actually getting, I'll get to see it, you know, for myself live and direct as opposed to, you know, the YouTube video. The album is titled, What Will You Do? It encompasses call to actions. Topics include youth, female marginalization, homelessness, poverty, and a big one now, um, human trafficking. And over the last few months from meeting people um, through different social media outlets, I can in all honesty say I did not realize how rampant human trafficking was. So for that person in your family that may joke about it or may feel, you know, well, it's okay. These women, you know, these kids or, you know, these young girls or these young boys put themselves in that situation. How important is it to be able to take a stance against people that think that way within your own family? That's a great question. Um, it's very important. Uh, it's very important. And usually people do that uh, because they don't realize that they are, even though it may not be a situation that is close to them, that there's something else that's close to them. And they don't realize the similarities in whether it's uh, the injustice or being treated unfairly. And they're thinking about it as somebody else's problem, but what is somebody else's problem is everybody's problem. Um, so I think it's definitely important. And I think one way to help uh, people realize and realize it is that you have to remind them that, you know, this is not the struggle that you go through. This is not the, you know, the issue that you may be feeling directly, but this is, or, you know, there's something else. Um, so I think it's definitely important. And uh, until people realize that we're all the same, different issues, different challenges, but we're all the same, you know, it's, it's definitely not going to be that uh, world change that Whitney is talking about in this album that she wants to see, um, because people have to... You have to sometimes you gotta make people see and feel, um, you know, that, that there's a struggle and that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. So, and I think Josh hit it on the nail on the head there in that there's so much impact that can be had by just engaging. You know, we don't want, we want to finish this album with people feeling like they need to do something, but once again, not to feel overwhelmed by the fact that there's nothing that they can do about these issues. It's about the fact that right at home and having those conversations and being preventative, that's doing something. And that allyship in particular, right, isn't about me as a black person talking to another black person about like our racism. It's about a white person talking to another white person about racism. So allyship in regards to sexual assault, you know, isn't about fellow survivors talking to each other. It's about, it's about, I don't want to generalize, but like male culture, right? Male dominating culture and like other males talking to other males about that. Same for like homophobia. It's not about gay people talking to each other, about straight people talking to each other. And there is something, I always say that, um, 
I always say that for social justice to happen, disruption needs to happen. And not like burning it down. I'm a pacifist. I mean like disruption of the mind, right? And I always say it takes, like, there are five things that, that can motivate a disruption. Either just like you're in the experience of marginalization, so you want to disrupt systems that are oppressing you. Uh, your just personal beliefs about what's right. Witnessing something. That's why like all of a sudden we're seeing all this stuff about police brutality touch people because of all these camera phones, you know. Right. Knowing someone personally that's marginalized. So me knowing someone of the LGBTQ community and like they're being a face on that pain. But And, and then if none of those four works, hearing from someone you trust. That makes a difference. It makes a difference for me to talk to another straight person about how homophobia is wrong. It makes a difference for a man to tell another man that victim blaming and saying that she deserved it because she or she wanted it because she was wearing it. That's a problem. It just it's just different. And so that's why these dinner table conversations, talking to your own family members who trust you and your insight, or talking to people who are just like you in these different categories, that has impact further than we know and that can stop a lot of horrible stuff from happening one mind at a time being disrupted <laughs> mm -hmm. I really like that saying and I want you to give it back to me one more time real slow in order for social change to happen and social justice to be achieved disruption needs to happen and not in the sense of burning it down but in the sense of like disrupting minds one at a time from this implicit bias and what turns what implicit bias that's a result of systemic oppression and so I always say that there are five motivations to disrupt. Either you're the one experiencing the marginalization, so you want to see disruption happen for your for your people's sake. You just have your just generally how you're oriented in terms of what you believe to be right and wrong. Uh, in terms of witnessing something blatant that just moves you, whether it's from like seeing the camera phones like killing another black person or experience. So like having a personal relationship with someone who's in that state of marginalization and seeing a face to that experience rather than like a judgment on the on the lifestyle. Uh, and then lastly, if none of those work, hearing from someone we trust and that's allyship. Allyship is you being that person that someone can trust that is moving the needle that way and influencing your mind. Wow, that no like and trust factor. No like and trust <laughs> always works. Now, before you guys take us into the end of the show with uh, with the song, what are, I'd like from each of you, three key points that you really want people to take away from our discussion? The first thing that comes to mind for me is that, um, and one, this is something that in working on this project, because I, I will admit to anybody that, um, I've grown um, in my awareness in working on this project, actually, and hanging around with me and, you know, hearing her talk about and be passionate about some of these things. Um, I feel like I've grown a lot just in, in this, this this process. So thank you for that. <laughs> I've never told you that. <laughs> I'm usually like, ah. Oh. You heard it right here first. <laughs> What did you say? I said the viewers heard it right here first. He said, thank right, you. Right, right, right. <laughs> the exclusive. <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna remind him of that. Right. I normally don't tell her that. I'm just like, uh huh, uh huh. <laughs> but um, we have we have great discussions. But I've I definitely have grown through this process. And um, the first thing I, I think that I would like for people to take away from this is that there is an urgent problem that we have. Um, and you know, I think that it's we're in a situation where it needs to people need to realize that, feel that. You know what I mean? Like it, sometimes people get in their own bubble, they get into their own schedule, their own way of life. And you're not, you know, you're not paying attention. You hear about stuff in the news. You know, nowadays there's so much news going on that you kind of you're we're desensitized to it now. Right. But people need to realize, take away that there is a problem. And the second thing I would say is the takeaway is that you can do something about it. <laughs> um, it can be small. It can be, you know, it doesn't have to be you going out and protesting and all that stuff at first or you know or ever. But it can be something small that um, that you do every day or every week or daily that um, helps push awareness and push for change. And then um, lastly, the last thing will be buy the album. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's plain and simple. You're right, I mean, it's, if nothing else, for, for two reasons. Number one, you're going to be provoked to, you know, a lot of music nowadays is, and I, and I love it, you know, I'm a lover of music, so... You know, a lot of music is just like, you know, you're, you're just grooving and it's not really necessarily 
make you think. It's not really making you challenge you. It just, it just feels good, which is great. That's what music should do. Um, this album is going to give you that. Um, it's going to give you, and it's also going to give you a challenge. You're going to be thinking. You're going to be provoked to thought. And that's just like a, a one-two punch. Um, the service, all the proceeds are going to SNS. And what they're going to be doing is going to be in itself uh, impacting the world and, and life changing. So your 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 money is going to to good ground, and um, and you're going to be given a, a product that is going to be well worth um, your time. So those are my three my three thoughts. Oh, yeah, I love <laughs> it. Thank you. <laughs> Passion. <laughs> um, I mean, I think he 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 touched on the big points there. Um, so I think probably to add, you know, I will say that um, all of, as we mentioned, all, all of these songs are pretty intensive, and uh, I don't want to be disregarding of the fact that these most most of the songs that were written here, it, I was sort of just moved by empathy for what it must be like for someone to go through this. So a lot isn't isn't even my personal experience, but I, that that doesn't mean that I know that people many people have had experiences with at least one of these. And so it is pretty intensive and intense and could be triggering. Uh, and I would always emphasize that people implement self-care where necessary if triggered by this, but that there's a difference between being triggered and uncomfortable. And so where some of this music is just uncomfortable to hear, that I push people to really challenge themselves to take it in because the fact of the matter is that Yes, it's hard to hear, but it's harder for someone to go through that. And people are going through that. And the only way that we can stop that from happening and support people who are going through that is if we do something about that. And so, yeah, point one is is just, you know, challenge yourself to really, really, really just start listening to the hard stuff. Because I think to a certain extent, people are desensitized because it's just too much. But someone's got to be listening because this is happening to people, uh, speaking to Josh's urgency. Um, Secondly, sort of going off of Josh's point that we, you know, you can all do something. I just sort of want to add into that that um, I think that it's really special that two black people who are under thirty um, are doing this, you know, and and uh, I just always want people to feel so empowered in what they can do to make a difference. We both decided we're going to change the world, right? And so, what does it look like to do that? And so, I want people to feel I don't. Everybody has different callings, but I want everyone to be all empowered in the impact that they can have. And impact does look like allyship. Impact just, just, just does look like choosing to do something. And so I just want the whole experience of this being created to be an example of that. Um, and that lastly, at the end of the day, I've always just believed that the point of life is just to like love each other and like <laughs> relationships. And that's just it. Shared humanity is it. That's it, you know? And so if anything, I'd want the biggest takeaway from this is to be action, but from the standpoint of shared humanity. We're all into this together and we're all a part of this world together. And thus it should feel on us to have a responsibility to take care of each other and care about each other and love each other and fill in the gaps where people aren't receiving that love as much as they should be. And we can all work to love harder. So those those are my roundabout takeaways. <laughs> wow, thank you. And you know, as I told you viewers, these two individuals were amazing and very passionate about this project and about their individual projects. So I hope you have enjoyed this with us. Do look forward again in the upcoming months to the individual interviews that we'll be doing because we really want to touch on Josh's school, some of the other music productions that he is working on. I really want to get into more aspects of, of allyship about SNS, Service Never Sleeps with Whitney. So keep it locked, put us on your calendar. We will be coming back soon to bring you those interviews. We're gonna close out the show with Whitney and Josh giving us a preview of the talk, which is the, it's the first single, right? Coming off of the album, the first single coming off the album. So we're gonna transition into that and we hope you enjoy this. There will be links down in the description for the website for Josh's School that's been mentioned and also where you can buy the album, buy the album, can't stress it enough, <laughs> buy the album. And I really want I really want to thank both of you again for your time. Thank you. Tora, this is such a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. And 
hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up. Stay alive, stay alive. Hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up. Stay alive, stay alive. Listen to me, son. Here's rule number one. If you Come, slow down, and if he comes your way, you stop. Get down and smile, obey in all you do. No matter what, please always make sure you have your hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up. Stay alive, stay alive hands up hands up hands up hands up stay alive stay alive here's rule number two no matter what they do sister no matter what they say